actually doing this because this is a this is a fairly serious matter uh, so we'll leave levity um, aside to all the people who brought friends with you just like uh, we'd ask thank you for that um, to everybody who's tuning in via live stream on youtube or or twitter thank you for joining us as well uh, if you aren't a member uh, of iff already please do consider becoming a member if you enjoy uh, or find useful the next 30 minutes because we are going to be giving you a fairly comprehensive breakdown Uh, of some of the legal technical aspects of this uh, criminal procedure identification bill 2022 uh, and what it means for um, the state of privacy in india uh, your constitutional rights and particularly how it may um, one day not very far in the future affect you uh, though we certainly hope that it doesn't i uh, i i've made like a very very um, sort of short informal sort of uh, presentation which i'm going to uh, just put up on screen if it lets me can people see that wait i can't see it okay now i can see it uh, so i assume everybody else can see it as well uh, okay so this is what we're talking about the criminal procedure bill 2022 um it it has several uh, quite concerning features where um it, it allows the police the power to gather vast amounts of personal uh, biological and biometric data about yourself um we're going to go over uh, some of the things that it allows the police to gather how long they can keep it and who are the people that they can gather this these measurements uh, from uh, this was recently tabled in the lok sabha without any pre legislative consultant con- consultation with relevant stakeholders so no not a lot of people have had a chance to look at this bill examine it see um, what its implications are uh, be able to analyze some of the issues that arise from it and give their feedback and inputs to um, the government uh, before before it saw the light of day in the lok sabha so by the time this call is over uh, you sh- these are some of the things that you will know um we'll answer all of these one by one what are these measurements whose measurements can be taken uh, which is uh, one of the more concerning areas where will they be stored uh, how long for uh, what will happen if you say no to providing these measurements uh, and what recourse do you have if uh, you believe that your measurements are wrongfully taken so to jump right in these measurements include a very wide broad range of uh, very personal data about your uh, biological and bodily attributes uh, there's finger impressions uh, footprint impressions which was there before uh, there's palm print impressions your photographs your iris and retina scans of your eyes um, physical samples biological samples uh, and their analysis behavioral attributes your signature your handwriting uh, and some sort of a medical examination as per the crpc now uh, very quickly vrinda i want to ask you before we move on um the definition for measurements includes this biological samples they've not defined biological samples so we don't know what it is do you do you think that it would be incorrect to assume that this refers to collection of dna like blood samples or cheek swabs or or hair or anything of that nature yes i think it definitely can include uh dna collection especially because biological samples are used separately you know we have photographs iris retina scans and then biological samples separately especially given the fact that the government had introduced the dna technology use in uh, application regulation bill in 2019 uh, which if you remember had also shown a government interest in using dna profiles and samples to facilitate the prosecution or adjudication in any criminal cases and in fact this was a concern that was also raised by the parliamentary standing committee in 2021 in its report so i think it can definitely include dna samples uh, unless and until the government comes and clarifies through some sort of like amendment uh, i think we should not just take any statement that may be made uh, if and when such a statement is made at face value i think the other thing is it's not just biological samples it's biological samples and their analysis so what this analysis means i think is a really and and i think you'll be speaking about this but i think this is something we should all be very concerned about because the analysis then potentially opens the door for a much wider scope of definition of measurements as well uh and you know what can be done with dna so it's not just dna samples but like what are the kinds of analysis that the government is then allowing and you know what it means for facilitating any database linking etc so i think that's something we can also discuss Uh, yeah thanks vinda um so this is what um i want to just do a very quick 
uh, comparison with the old act, which is the Identification of Prisoners Act 1920, uh, where they were uh, only gathering finger impressions and footprint impressions. Uh, and over time, that evolved to photographs as well. But if you see uh, the provision of this bill in 21B, uh, it has been considerably expanded to include all of these things that we just mentioned, including the biological samples that uh, Vinda talked about. Uh, quickly, uh, Abhinav, can you explain some of the other changes that have been made in the bill as compared to the 1920 Act? Uh, before that, actually, I want to sound a small note of caution which is uh, that if you think about the Identification of Prisoners Act of 1920, it actually pertained to a matter that was falling within the concurrent list that gave powers to both the centre and the states to amend provisions of the Act. And so what had happened is that while we often pay attention to what the centre had done, they were actually, they were actually state-level amendments as well to some of uh, the provisions within the Act. So just wanting to flag that for everyone's consideration. Uh, you know, when we look at the additional data points, for instance, or even where we speak about who did the old act cover and uh, what has been the change in so far as the new act is and the new bill is concerned. So just we need to uh, remember that having sort of laid that out there, Tanmay, you've already mentioned probably what is the biggest change and what is the change that had been suggested by not only the Law Commission, but also by the Supreme Court around 1980. And surprisingly, these were developments that occurred almost simultaneously. Uh, the Law Commission in its 87th report had really aggressively recommended that we change the scope of the Identification of Prisoners Act for it to include a wider spectrum of you know, measurements because strictly speaking, it does not include too much. And even by 1980, the scope of criminal investigations had broadened far beyond just finger impressions, footprint impressions, and photographs, which is another provision within the Act. So that seems to have been one of the key driving features of this, uh, of this statute, uh, of this proposed statute, rather. Now, as far as the other changes are concerned, what Vrindas flagged is, again, very relevant, which is about the analysis. What we have after that, and I think you have another slide in this as well, about how the scope with respect to arrested persons and the persons whose measurements can be taken is being changed. What the earlier Identification of Prisoners Act did was to have separate clauses which dealt with convicted persons, which dealt with other persons. And there is also a residuary power that's saved with judges to order any person to give their measurements if the judge considers that it is relevant for any inquiry or investigation. That residual power has not been touched. But what has happened is there has been a reordering in terms of what happens with convicted persons and non-convicted persons. And within that reordering, there has also been a widening of the scope of powers that are vested with the police. And so now any arrest, any arrested person, right, in connection with any offense, as opposed to what used to be the provision, is liable to provide their measurements. Now, there is a proviso there that is, again, very unhappily worded. So if you can just zoom into that little proviso that's there within Section 3. So if you look at the scheme of that clause, it talks about how persons arrested in connection with an offense punishable under any law for the time being in force or detained under preventive detention law, provided that any person arrested for an offense committed under any law, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, may not be obliged to allow taking of his biological samples. So either this could have been, you know, a direct sort of imperative to the police saying you can't take their samples. It could have been a direct imperative to the individual saying you do not have to give your samples. What we have is an odd middle ground, which is saying you may not be obliged to allow taking of your biological sample. So it's a little unclear, but let's see whether it, the, the uh, ironing out of the chinks happens uh, during the course of this bill through parliament. There are also some changes in respect of how the, uh, and I, I don't know, you want me to move on to how the data processing angles have been changed dramatically by the proposed bill, or would you want to lead into that first? No, no, by all means, go for it. Okay, uh, before but... that, 
Abhinav, one minute. Yeah. Don't you also think in terms of since we're talking about wording, right? If you look at the proviso, look at the bracket. So, provided that any person arrested for an offence committed under any law, except for an offence committed against a woman or a child, so presumably a more serious offence, or for any offence punishable. Not, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, the exception. So, so that's you know, what. That's that's the odd part, right? You could have simple assault also, but where the victim yes. is a woman, which is why it's slightly odd. Where the theft case is, so imagine a chain snatching. Yeah. I mean, which is why even the bracketed part is odd, but that need not concern the members. I didn't flag that, but it's even the bracketed part is not uh, as specific as it ought to be. So yeah, it was basically that, and for a yeah. period not less than seven years. Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, so that's also stuff. Basically, I wanted to flag that going into sort of super detail, I guess. Uh, but since you were making this point about yeah, that, because if you look at it, it is actually except for an offence committed against a woman or a child, or for any offence punishable with imprisonment for a period. It's not even a coterminous requirement where it has to be both. Yeah, which is why it could be any offence so long as the victim is a woman or a child, which is. a really odd sort of requirement like how does that make sense so that's what that's what like, i want to flag basically. what if the what, what if a woman is a victim of a financial fraud like how that there is an assumption there and i think all of us recognize that assumption but clearly the english used to express it has been uh, not far from desirable as such uh, um, yeah uh, speaking of english um, i want to stay with this may not be obliged for just a little bit longer because i'm still a little bit confused about it abhinav um my my question to you is with whom does the discretion lie so so that does so this mean that unclear. i as an accused person right so I that's i think that that's entirely unclear right, exactly. and there was actually an exchange i saw on twitter on an iff thread as it so happened mm -hmm. where in the explainer that iff had put out on twitter a user had mentioned that you know it doesn't seem to be that way and it seems like the person affected has the ability to turn around and say hey no but that's not really clear right because even if yeah, it exactly. is may if it were if it would just say may not allow taking of his biological samples that is okay. what is may not be obliged to right to be that's what right. like obliged and a group is any can ever oblige i mean it's the exactly you are morally bound you are never morally bound to help the prosecution as an accused person so it's really odd the use of language here is uh, like it's far from desirable so yeah i mean very interesting to see how that gets defended while we're on this can you explain a little bit about how this would interact with article 20 uh, sub article 3 no so all of this like this legislation directly fits the bill right so for those who are not very uh, you know well versed with what article 20 sub clause 3 entails it's like this lost step child of like indian constitutional law but basically there is something called the right against compelled self incrimination which is basically that no person accused of an offence shall be compelled to be a witness against himself saying himself because that's what the statute the constitution says but ultimately there are that that idea of being a witness against yourself is not something that is as broad as the words indicate because the supreme court way back when in a really interesting decision which uh, we don't really know too much about called kathikalu ogard said that it's basically information that is non testimonial in nature so you giving a basically giving samples of any sort right so giving a thumb print giving blood samples anything that will require a comparison with a sample that has been collected in the investigation so that is not directly incriminating you that is only helping confirm and identify the sample that has been collected and so all of that is outside of the scope of your right against compelled self incrimination all of what is within the scope of the criminal procedure bill and all all of what was within the scope of the identification of prisoners act was this right so this entire exercise is premised upon the collection of samples and comparison of samples to affirm the identity of persons so it is on one level directly affecting self incrimination but by way of the supreme court's decision that continues to hold the field it is not within the scope of protection but at the same time what is required to be noted is while it might not be within the scope of self incrimination the manner in which these samples are taken is still a matter of scrutiny in law 
and the reason why there was a problem with the identification of prisoners act limited scope is that if you wanted to take measurements beyond what was there right fingerprints and thumbprints to police require legal sanction to be able to do so the truth of the matter is they haven't been doing so with the legal sanction but they have been doing so right we we've, we've seen news from all over the country where facial recognition technology is in play the 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 trick there is that people don't get stopped but in some parts of the country people do get stopped and that stopping is actually a, is, is like a civil wrong as such because the police have no authority to stop you to do that so which is why the law commission had recommended that you need to broaden the scope of the act because that is actually illegal and that is by extension a violation of article 21 as well because you are being deprived of your personal liberty either for those 5 minutes but it can even extend to a longer duration of time so the reason to amend the old act and you know broaden the scope is actually to confer police the authority which they have desperately wanted frankly i mean we are all here to express our views i think that it ought to be expanded because one can have very little qualms with the idea that the collection of these samples might be necessary from an investigative perspective the problem is how do you go about it and that is where there is a lot left to be desired in what the first draft of this bill seems to be which is why uh, i think when we proceed with the discussions uh, that will become more evident I, does that answer does that answer what you would ask me then man very comprehensively okay very comprehensively thanks pinda i would also just add i mean it's not uh, i mean it's kind of relates to what abhinav is saying which is that you know we're talking about this as the first draft and i would really hope that this is actually only a first draft that if the law is to be passed it undergoes a lot more changes and it's you know sent to a standing committee there's more consultation especially because this is a criminal law right and i think we always talk about a criminal law being having to be even more clear right more narrowly tailored than even a civil law because this is actually affecting people's rights and liberties in the most direct manner like it is the way in which many people will interact with the legal justice system so i think it is absolutely you know something that there should be a lot more sort of conversations around this and to try and say that look we need this bill this it cannot be passed in this way there cannot be so much you know legal uncertainty about what is the meaning of may not be applied what is the meaning of biological samples what is the meaning of analysis i mean the lack of definitions is pretty shocking when you consider that the you know in the personal data protect i mean now the data protection bill you obviously have that many definitions right each and every clause is defined um so i think the lack of definitions in general and the lack of explanation is something that is very worrying i see yeah thanks i i agree with that actually so just let me just move on with the presentation uh right so this is another point of concern that binda i believe you uh, pointed out in um, an op-ed that you written for the hindustan times that i that i had the pleasure of reading this morning uh, which is where will these measurements be stored because we know that um, the police is going to be gathering all of these measurements we know that they intend to store it for 75 minutes a uh, spoiler alert that's in the next slide but we know that they're going to store it for 75 years 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 yeah. years, years 75 years um but where will they be held they will be stored with the national crime records bureau which is the ncrb um they will prescribe the manner for sharing dissemination destruction and disposal of records this is all in section 4 um and they can share the records with any law enforcement agency in a manner that the central government will prescribe the central government will also prescribe the manner for collection storing preservation of these measurements um vrinda you spoke a little bit about this uh, in your article that i had read what what are some potential problems with this data uh, centralization and what appears to be easy sharing within the government yeah i think so couple of uh, concerns right one why are we centralizing all of this data so obviously the government is going to say oh it's because of ease of access and it's you know easy coordination but at the end of the day when you centralize everything with the ncrb you are doing that without providing any checks or balances there is no safeguard that is prescribed in the law that limits like things like even access control right so who in the ncrb for instance has access to this data is it everybody from the junior most employee to the senior most officer so there is no access control there is also no limits on or safeguards on who can actually uh, you know what are the conditions under which somebody can access this data so one is who can access the data within ncrb the second is you know that person so if if you look at interception or you know interception rules you have the home secretary only who can authorize interception under certain specific conditions 
Here it is anybody with an NCRP and really for any purpose. We are not clear under what conditions can they access this really sensitive data, right? And when you combine it, when you imagine the kind of data that there is going to be, when you collect all state data, what are your security safeguards? The bill doesn't even pay any lip service to the importance of security, right? To say that when you are then collecting all this data in one database, the, I, the potential for unauthorized leakage, the potential for hacking is really problematic. And then the, you know, this other point that you've mentioned that these records can be shared with any law enforcement agency. Again, for what purpose, right? Uh, is there any sort of idea of a purpose limitation? Or, you know, principles of data protection that we have seen have applied uh, internationally, even in such laws, right? Which India still does not have a data protection act. You are then kind of facilitating more and more data basification of individuals and the sharing of databases, which we are already seeing happening with CCTNS, with facial recognition technology, where different data sets are being combined. And so now if I'm being stopped by the police for a mask violation in COVID, does that mean, you know, is that data then going to be entered, going to be used in other cases? Um, and this will actually become important even from a state amendment perspective. So, you know, uh, Abhinav had mentioned state amendments that have happened to the 1920 law. And some of those also go with these habitual offender acts that exist in various states, right? And these acts are horribly vaguely worded. I mean, that's another kind of discussion for another day if you look at how vaguely worded these laws are and who can be classified. But, you know, I think those are concerns and one will have to raise about what is the purpose for which these are being used. Who are the people who get classified, right? There is obviously um, a certain section of like the marginalized section in population from a caste, class, religious perspective, who then get flagged regularly for such crimes. Uh, so I think, I mean, I think section four is actually even more problematic in a way than section three, because NCRB then has too much power. And I think your next slide, you're probably going to discuss the 75 years. Which I think post so Putnam Swami four has more. Yeah, it kind of doesn't end. Uh, <laughs> I think post Putnam Swami, I honestly do not see how something like this can be held to be constitutional. In fact, the Supreme Court in Putnam Swami, in the Aadhaar judgment specifically, actually struck down various provisions of the authentication regulations that called for like the retention of authentication information for five years. So, and you know, they cited a bunch of uh, comparative law, including a famous uh, Digital Rights Ireland judgment of the European Court of Justice, uh, which again was similarly, you know, police powers, retention of data, and said that you cannot keep it for so long. Now, this 75 years basically exists even after I die, right? There is no kind of end point. It exists if I am a juvenile and my data is taken, it exists well into my adult life, which then again becomes contrary to principles of the JJ, the Juvenile Justice Act. Uh, you know, the idea of a fresh start, the idea of, you know, dignity, privacy, confidentiality, all of these things. So I think, and more importantly, there is no explanation. The government is not even bothered explaining what is the reason for 75 years, right? What is your law enforcement purpose for 75 years? I mean, you're not solving that same crime 75 years later. So I just think it's literally like choosing a number out of a hat and then just keeping that. And I think this provision, I don't really see it surviving a constitutional challenge. Oh, well, that's a little bit of glimmer of hope. Thanks for that, Minna. Uh, let me just move to the next slide. Hope is that, at least. Uh, sorry, then I can yeah, we I circle back to the previous one. Yeah, just, I'm actually happy to bring you in on this because I, I read a little bit of your writing from earlier this week where um, it actually put things in perspective for me, which is that uh, the life expectancy in India hovers around 70 years, which is less than the data retention period. That, so, that's Vrinda dealt with that. I actually want uh, to flip the coin and make that point about data retention in the other way, which is to look at the exception that you flagged in the slide here, which is mm -hmm. that the measurements will be kept. However, if a person is released without trial or discharged or is acquitted, then the information may be destroyed. Now, first of all, let's just be very clear that this is not the exception. If you look at the information that we get from people, like if you look at it from a funneling perspective, uh, mm -hmm. conviction rates are less than 50% on the whole. Charge cheating rates are very high, yes, but there is still a sizable number of people who do not, after their arrest, actually matter to the investigation, let alone to the trial. So this is not an insignificant number of people who are going to be affected by this requirement of data deletion. It's, it's actually going to be a significant number of people who are going to be affected. What's happened in the, in the draft is that there is no clear mechanism in terms of actualizing this requirement. 
So all it says is that there is going to be deletion unless a court records that there ought not to be. But when you say there is going to be deletion, if you then match it with what Brinda just said about how that data is being kept, to which nook and cranny of that big Leviathan, which is our state machinery, will that requirement need to travel and how will it travel? And we've seen this with Shreya Single and 66A, right? Like unless you have a clear mechanism to convey information, it doesn't matter how good the objective is. You need a system that is clearly demarcating okay, this is how the information is going to reach the concerned bureaucratic officer. So either it ought to have said that a court order will be passed to all concerned or to all people who are holding the databases. The problem is this will actually end up being more detailed probably in the rules that may be drafted if this act comes to pass. But whenever that happens, this is a serious requirement that requires like consideration because unless the, you know that path is clearly articulated, it's going to lead to a lot of uh, unnecessary, actually unconstitutional data retention. And I think that is actually the perverse incentive that you get by not clarifying it, right? Because if you do not clarify it, you get to keep that data which you are otherwise ought to have deleted. And so that overall objective of databasing is something that ends up being fulfilled. So you end up creating a database of so many people by virtue of them just not being aware of how best to exercise their legal remedies. And when you look at it from the perspective of the criminal justice system, we know that a disproportionately large number of people who are going to be falling within those categories of people arrested, people charged, people convicted, are people belonging to minority slash uh, whatever, underprivileged backgrounds, because that is how the criminal justice system works. So yeah. I think like whenever, however that happens, this is also another issue that has the potential to really uh, blow up when the bill moves forward. In fact, speaking about people not knowing their legal remedies, I think one of the issues with this is that it's a little bit unclear on what your legal remedy is here. Um, if you if you refuse to provide your measurements, um, the bill says that you will be charged with section 186 of the Indian Penal Code which is obstructing a public service uh, servant in discharge of their public functions, which can land you in jail for uh, up to three months. Uh, it, it also says that um, it shall be lawful for the police officer or prison officer to take such measurements in such manner as may be prescribed if any person um, refuses or resists in uh, the taking of these measurements. So, so if, so if is... you believe that, yeah, go on. No, no, I'm saying this is basically, this is a, if you believe that you have the right, but you obstruct it, the law is actually telling you obstruct it. And in that trial under section 186, whenever that happens, you lead that as a defense. It's mm. a, it's a, I mean, it's an odd position to hold, but that is actually what the law will say about enforcing a lot of these rights that an individual will be given. So even if you look at, let's say the right to remain silent in a police examination, the law is actually that. I mean, for good or bad, the law is actually that you can stay silent, but you always run the risk of a prosecution for obstructing justice. In that prosecution for obstructing justice, you may then say, I had a right to remain silent. Now, I the see. validity of that defense will be decided in that other trial. But it is also still allowing the police to take action against you under section 186 as is specified here and as was also specified under the old act. So this hasn't been changed. What I, I also see. wanted to just flag before you move ahead mm -hmm. is section Go 5, which we had referred to earlier, which is that residuary power of the judge. So one thing that you will find common in both, and again, this is uh, relating to an overarching theme of concern with this bill, which is the total disregard of uh, not only natural justice, but also the fact that we are, at least we purport to be a constitutional democracy that believes in individual liberty and well, fundamental rights. Section 5 doesn't require the judge to give an order that has reasons. Section 5 does not require an opportunity of hearing, at least on its own terms. How can that be? And in fact, this was one of the specific things that the Law Commission's report the 87th report that I had mentioned earlier required that you should clearly say that you have to give reasons. Now, although you might still say that, sure, that that can happen by an indirect way, you can hope that a magistrate does. But 
the section ought to require it and more importantly there is no opportunity of hearing that is clearly specified yeah so does that happen behind your back how does it happen all of those questions arise and therefore give scope to litigation now you might win that litigation but when we are at the stage where we have the ability to avoid that litigation one really hopes that parliament takes that path that avoids litigation rather than generates so just wanted to flag that before you moved ahead and also like the question then raises who are the people who are actually capable of taking that litigation forward right who are capable of making absolutely made known like it is then people who may have you know there is a certain then privilege big that becomes associated with even being able to raise these questions further so i think that's why to my earlier point about clarity in the law is so important and also we must realize there is a i mean one can say if you go back to section 6 right that yes it's a 186 offense but i mean let's be clear if the police tells you how many people will really be able to say no right how many people in a realistic situation will be able to exercise any rights so i think that's why you know you have to understand the context in which also interactions with the police happen uh, yeah. when you understand the real impact of these laws yeah okay so it's 533 but we began at 503 so hopefully people will like forgive us but there is just one last point that we need to talk about before um we let the people who are joining us by live stream go which is that what recourse will you have if you believe uh, that your measurements were wrongfully taken now we don't have a data protection law uh, we don't have um, any recourse that is provided to us under the bill in fact we have uh, section 7 which says that no suit or any other proceeding shall lie against any person for anything done or intended to be done in good faith under this act or any rule made there under uh, now i've written down that you can file a writ petition uh, brinda do you think that would be a good idea to do i mean i think that is realistically probably what will end up happening for with most people trying to raise these issues because some of these issues you know you would need a constitutional court deciding these questions since they raise constitutional concerns about its interaction with different fundamental rights so yeah i think one would file a writ petition Okay, uh, but I think with that we. I actually want to. I want to flag something it. more before yes, we go I'm ahead, not. which is again to bring for everyone's attention the fact that this is one of those statutes where, or uh, this is like an empowering statute where a lot is going to happen post the law is eventually passed by way of subordinate legislation, either rules at the central level, primarily at the state level actually, and so a lot of the. you know the nuts and bolts will get figured out when the act is implemented by the states and this is actually you know this is merely the trailer of what is actually going to happen on the ground so what we are dealing with here are the high level issues but how they get operationalized there is definitely scope to make the the rigors of the act lesser and less harsh but that that's again something that will fall upon the states who will have to operationalize this bill as they have been operationalizing the 1920 act and so are you leaving us not have happened which I, i mean i would argue that like a law like this has to incorporate certain safeguards at the central absolutely level. and so yeah. that's what so th- that issue will arise as to how much can you leave to these states and especially the requirements of making sure and so just uh, you know making that point which i uh, wanted to try and make earlier as well but you we are we are replacing a 1920 act in 2022 we have it's not like no water has flown under the bridge since then right we we got independence we became a constitutional republic putta swami judgment comes and recognizes the right to privacy what this bill seems to be premised is in a different reality where no water has flown under the bridge it is as if you are living in the same reality as 1920 where you will have the same rights and liberty and the police ought to have the same expansive powers as they used to in 1920 if not more which is where at some level it is an assault on the senses you know you really have to take a step back to believe what has been again tried to be pushed through parliament it is not the first time it is probably not the last time at all either but it it really is an assault on the senses and i think it's surprising because the government has in other previous bills i mean even if you take aadhar right like at least the law does prescribe certain safeguards right whether you agree yeah. that they're enough or not is a different question but there is a certain recognition 
you know, of the need to have security, of the need to have some privacy constraints, of the need to not be able to collect certain data. If you look at the data protect the data protection bill, again, there is a recognition of these concepts. So it's not that also these are some foreign concepts that we are importing in India. These are concepts that apart from the Supreme Court having now reiterated, the government itself has kind of recognized them to some extent. So I think that's why it's even more surprising. Yeah. Okay, so we've run uh, seven minutes over, but actually four minutes over. Uh, so I am going to uh, end the live stream now. If you stuck with us for so long, thank you very much. Um, please, if you are not already a member of IFF, please do consider becoming a member of IFF. Uh, if you are a member of IFF or donor, thank you so much for that. Um, it allows us to have these conversations. Uh, uh, we, we uh, Brinda, Avinav and I are all lawyers with IFF. It allows us to have these conversations offline and now also online. So thanks for being here. And 